Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Liquid Mali South Africa and um, our live Facebook interview. Uh, we're so fortunate to have two wonderful women. Women are wonderful all over the world. And I just wanted to start this interview today. It's Women's Month. Uh, women are doing and showing the most amazing things all over South Africa and over the world. We've seen some amazing ads from ma massive companies. And um, it's so amazing to be able to see if there's actually a month where women are celebrated, where all these stars and the, all these achievements are actually highlighted. So that's awesome. So I wanted to start, before I introduce our ladies, just with a quote. A strong woman is one who feels deeply and loves fiercely. Her tears flow just as abundantly as her laughter. A strong woman is both soft and powerful. She is both practical and spiritual. A strong woman, in her essence, is a gift to the world. So we are very fortunate to have two gifts with us today. And um, on the one side, we have Tasman Pepper. So it, she comes from a family of racing. So we had a joke a little bit earlier, but I think when she came out of the wound, she was already in some kind of a car thing going down the hall in the hospital. <laughs> uh, because it's been racing from very little. So welcome, Tasman. Yes, thank you for having me. It's uh, good to be here. So we're going to uh, on an adrenaline junkie from a very small age. Mm. And then next to her, Chantal, she just helped me to say her surname. So I'm just going to have to read it because otherwise I'm going to totally mess it up. Ro Rohotas. Yes, you did very well. Okay, okay. so for, from here, it's going to be Chantal R. Like I Ar love the R. <laughs> Chantal R. Define. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And we look forward to having a chat to you about, you know, women and the powerful women out there. So I'm excited because... We have in both very dynamic women um, in two different industries. I mean, from, a, from Taz, um, we're going to go into a little bit of background, but a lot of it I want you to share yourself. So I'm telling the same with you. But it is so amazing to see women stand out in business. And I think there's a lot of women out there that have sometimes just need that inspiration, just see, be able to see someone else do it and get that inspiring feeling and be able to say, Sometimes I always think if someone looks at me and they go, if she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> then I know I've done something. And something. Sometimes it's something small. But um, if women stand together, it just opens up that possibility for people to be able to stand out and thrive and not feel that they have to stand in the shadow and not have the support they have or the support they need to be strong women and make it an impact in the world. And if you look at the numbers in the world, I mean, there are far more women than men. And um, it's always amazing to see that it is a commodity that I still think is so undervalued because there are so many amazing things that are consistently happening in the world just because women are getting out of their shells and being inspired and achieving different things. So let's start. Um, so everybody that's listening, we are going to a little bit later give a couple of things away. So I know from the Premier League side, but I want you to get to know the two amazing women that we have with us today. And I want to start with Tasman. So Tasman has, um, you come from a family of racing, your father, Ian, which is, I mean, everybody that knows um, Ian Pepper, he's such a fun loving, always the ball of the party. Um, and your, your brother, Jordan, uh, been racing and with Bentley, uh, also well known. But you have been racing since 1995. I mean, you were born in 1990. I started with go-karts. I mean, I have a, a list of all your achievements from 1995. Yeah, I think there's a lot there. You're going to be <laughs> reading forever. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't the point. <laughs> but it's, it's unbelievable the things that you've been able to achieve. Um, if I can just ask you, just to be able to share with everybody, was it something when you started racing, was it a love from, from very little because the entire family is racing? Or did, did your dad strap you into a go-kart <laughs> and say... Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like you said, uh, my dad's been involved in motorsports pretty much his whole life, and his dad, uh, my grandfather, was involved. So I was at the racetrack from two weeks old. Um, my mom and I traveled with my dad around the countryside while he raced. Um, so I think just being involved and being there all the time, I think you automatically start enjoying it and start loving it, and it's something that you want to do. 
Um, I started at a very young age. I started at the, my dad got me in the go-kart when I turned four years old. So <laughs> he taught me in the shop right um, parking lot or hop around the parking lot how to stop and how to go. So, um, yeah, I think I was always involved and I was always around. And I think that's where the love came for it. And initially, I, I can't remember, you know, that long ago and how I started and how I became all about it. I do remember a girl in a pink go-kart, Tanith Gardner. And I think that's what I wanted to do. And I saw that and I was like, Dad, I want to, you know, I want to start. I want to get going. And, yeah, I mean, he put in the time and he put in the effort. And he initially said that I wasn't really interested. I, I, I wanted to go to the racetrack, but I wanted to be at the racetrack with my friends and, you know, take my bicycle and end up riding my bicycle around instead of actually racing. <laughs> and so he kind of put the effort into my, my cousin because my cousin started at the same time. We were both the same age. And eventually one day it just turned and I wanted to be there. I wanted to race and I wanted to win. And that's where it all kind of eventually started you know and yeah I mean my dad put in lots and lots of time and effort with us we were racing every single weekend putting in the time and we still had to go to school unfortunately but <laughs> <laughs> my mom didn't allow us to miss that <laughs> out but you know every weekend we were racing and we are a very close family I think because of it um we spent a lot of time together. My younger sister, she's two years younger. She doesn't race, but she was always involved and always was with us at, at the racing and the biggest supporter that we had. So I think as a whole family, it, it helped us and it helped us grow in that, in that way because we had so much support behind us. And everyone always asks me, is it because you're a woman it was a lot harder? But it, it never was because I only ever raced against guys. So to me, they were just another competitor that I needed to beat. They weren't, oh, because they're a guy, it's going to be harder, or because they're a girl, it will be easier. So I think it pushed me and it made me the racing driver that I am today because I was challenged so much harder, like, growing up. And, um, yeah, I think that's how I've been able to, to progress through the ranks, and now I'm racing internationally again. So, so amazing to hear. I've, I've heard uh, so many um, female athletes that always train against men because they know they have to push themselves harder to be able to get better so that when they compete against other women they're much stronger so i think maybe you don't know about it but there's other men that you beat that don't <laughs> race anymore <laughs> it was yeah the i mean well I, I think for the guys it's obviously a lot <laughs> more difficult um although i'm a, a i'm another competitor on the grid they know i'm a girl so that like if they go away and they know, oh yeah, I got beaten by a chick this weekend, you know, <laughs> it's not so great. But to me, it didn't make any difference. And it actually made me want to win that much more because they kept basically telling me that I couldn't do it. So for me, it made me fought, like fight harder and to, to just push myself that a little bit harder. And I mean, there were certain times that I used to go internationally to a race events and I was actually laughed at when I got onto the grid. I had my ponytail sticking out, the back of my pink helmet, and I put the cart down and you, I actually got laughed at until the end of the first session where I'm just on top of the grid sheet and they're like, oh, sh maybe we need to start looking at this a little bit closer, you know, and taking her more seriously. So I think it always has just pushed me harder. And I mean, now I'm competing in the W Series. I did last year and it's an all women series and the first ever one that's, that's been around. So um, everyone is like, oh, it's going to be so easy for you. You're racing against girls now. You've beaten guys, so it can't be that difficult. <laughs> but we've all come from the same backgrounds. We've all grown up racing against men. So we're all just as competitive as one another. And I think it's actually been one of the hardest championships I've ever had to race in. And these girls are really, really fast. So not only in their goals, they're just another competitor that are really competitive and we all want to achieve the same thing and that's to win a championship. But I must acknowledge you. I mean, the W Series, I know there was uh, eventually a 64 that had to compete against each other um, to be able to then have the, the knockout kind of round. You ended up 10th, so they automatically put you in the round for the 2020 and then we had this whole a pandemic yeah. uh, meeting <laughs> us but that I mean that's an amazing achievement and I've seen the ladies I mean for those of you that, that know nothing about the W series so that's Formula 3 as yes. they call it now so yeah. even in Formula 1 uh, there's only been five women that's ever um, taken part in Formula 1 yeah from the five of them only two have actually qualified so five have started Formula 1 two have actually qualified and um it's unbelievable in 1975, um, uh, what's it, Lela, I think, uh, came and uh, she was in top six. 
And um, to be able to now see in the level of competition with all the women around the world in the W Series, from 64, ending up 10, I mean, that's so well done. And, and, and you're from South Africa. Yeah, yeah you're the only <laughs> woman from South Africa, but it's possible. So it's just, but the commitment, I think that is, and that's what I want to get from Chantal now as well, nothing in life is possible without that commitment. I mean, I've seen you and your father and the whole family uh, when it is on uh, over weekends with racing, whether it's the enduro racing with your dad with the motorcycles and the events when it is any other racing where other people are hanging around and rowing and doing, you are committed, you are there, <laughs> yeah. you are making sure that you practice. So it's not something that just comes easy. There's a dedication there that is different than the norm. And you still have to go to school, but still that consistent making sure that you're improving every single day because you've seen the level of competition out there, even amongst women. Yeah, I mean, it, it isn't just a arrive and drive and, you know, you're going to win, uh, win a race. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of time and effort and bums in the seats. And not only is it driving that's going to make you that much better, but it's also behind the scenes. You've got to train. You've got to be mentally focused. You There's so many things that impact how you position on the track and how well you do um, in a championship. Um so it, it, there's a lot of hard work that goes behind it. And like you said, even when we go to the racing with my dad and he's now doing enduros again or off-roads, and um, we're all there and we support each other. And I think support structure is the biggest thing that impacts where you actually head off to, you know. And like my brother's doing really, really well overseas now and he's a factory Bentley driver, so he's getting paid to race. <laughs> so he's got the, the ultimate ideal. dream <laughs> job, you know. Um, and... You know, but he never would have got to that position without the hard work and dedication that he put into it. He left South Africa as soon as he finished matric and he moved to Germany. He didn't have family there, he, but he knew that this is what he wanted to pursue. And my parents gave him that opportunity and gave him those two years with the funding to go, to go and fight for his dream. And now he's worked his way for the last six years and now he's got there. You know, he's actually being paid to race. So... It takes a lot of dedication, a lot of um, sacrifices, a lot of time off from seeing your friends because you want to you you want to work to that position at the top, you know. So you can't always go out jawling with your mates, and you know. So you kind of have those friends who understand, and there's some friends who just don't get it. Um, but you, ha as long as you have that support structure and those people are standing behind you to push you in that direction, there's no reason why you can't you can't reach that ultimate goal, you know. And I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's taken a lot. I've been racing for 25 years now, and this is the first year that I actually haven't been able to race anything. Um, so it's been quite difficult. Um, a lot of time at work. <laughs> um, I like the, you know, getting to fly overseas and to be able to have that little gap from being stuck at the office. But, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to work for my, f my family and my dad in the, in the business that he's grown. And, um, and it's given me that chance to take a break when I needed to, to go racing and to go do what I really love to do. And, um, you know, if I worked for anyone else, I w that wouldn't be possible. So, yeah, I think it's just, it's the backing that you have. And just if it's something you want to do, like there's no reason, no one's stopping you. If it's something you want to go for, you need to go for it. And you've got to put in the work and the time and the effort to get there. So, so true. And I think the support structure, even in, in the women environment for all different business. So, so. On that note, I want to move over to, to Chantal. And um, now I've heard dedication, I mean, um, and, and everything that goes into being a success in something. You have a couple of things that you are busy with. Um, so you have an events company um, creating the most amazing wedding um, um, uh, functions that totally blows people away. Uh, and I've seen the detail you go in in your website and... Um, with the whole COVID-19, that actually came to a halt. And you actually just said, you know what, I have to do something else. And seeing how innovative you are, you came up with other ideas. So Chantal, if you can just, what inspired you? Because you know, I know you have a BCom in, in business management that you got in Stellenbosch. Um, but from a young age, have you always wanted to do business? Have you always been so inspired in an entrepreneur? and wanting to make sure that you can grow and, and start a business and, 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 and something that you can be creative. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an amazing story for me. Actually, when I sit here and I resonate with it, um, 
I started in, in Stelly's and I went from one kind of environment to another, but it always ended up being a creative environment. It was always something that I wanted to do was creative. And my mom and dad were like, so why would you want to be a merchandise buyer for a shop, like Urban Degree? And I was like, because I can be creative. And then I went from there and I went into marketing and that didn't suit well. Then I went to my mom's business and I actually started in my, ma my family business and she did uh, loyalty programs, so embedded value propositions. And I ended up going um, to see, um, at that stage it was Stain. Um, those sta was it Stain uh, in, um, what was the company that was recently liquidated or they had problems? It was a big furniture company. I forget the name now. It's okay. Well, well anyway, <laughs> so, anyway, so on that note, I then any, I found, like, passion in, in putting... It, no, it wasn't with <laughs> it was, but I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And um, I think it was called the Bravo Group. That's what it was oh, called. Yes. And Bravo used to have, like, Edbo and Slumberland and all those kinds of things. So then, from that side, I ended up getting involved in, you know, decorating lodges. So I went out of my mom's business and started doing the decorating of lodges there because of the creative side again. And then it came to my wedding, and when I did my wedding, I, that's when I knew what my passion was. It was this, like, doing events and, and setting up stuff and making it look good. And it wasn't about the making it look good. Look, I'm a perfectionist, and I, I identify, I'm like, I conceptualize things, and I'm, like, attention to detail. And, but it was all around what people thought, you know, when they, when they walked into a room, what they experienced. You know, that was a big thing for me. And um, it was always the reaction I would get that I loved, you know. And that resonated with me. And then I was in a, geez, I was in a corporate telecoms business for almost 10 years. And I did uh, communication strategies with big banks and retailers. And I would go to Cape Town and I had Cathy Tech and Woolworths and TFG and all that uh, as a backing. And I loved the corporate world. I loved it. Uh, but yeah, this passion kept like kind of driving me. And then in 2014, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up the event business. But obviously... You're always so scared. And, and I want to say to women out there, you know, if you don't push yourself to a different level, you'll never know if you can do it or not. It is a big risk and it's a big jump, but so worth it at the end because, you know, when I, when I look back in my life and to where I am now because I've also got some exciting stories to tell, it's just, yeah, it's incredible, you know, what you can achieve if you believe in yourself. And I think as women, we need to learn to believe in ourselves more, you know. And, um, yeah, then COVID happened and... Uh, that, that kind of brought my business to an abrupt halt. And I was doing a lot of weddings, bigger scale weddings, and then went into a very corporate world. I enjoyed the corporate space. It was a quicker turnaround time for me. And I enjoyed the corporate relationship I would, I would make with people. And, you know, that ended up being golf days and seminars and conferences and you name it. I've done, I've done it quite a bit. And when COVID hit, I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm a, like a, a mom now and I need to look after my daughter and I don't know what I'm going to do because, I mean, you know, <laughs> how am I going to make money here? And I've always been very, like, self-sufficient and reliant on myself as a woman. And it's, it's a big thing for me to always take care of myself. And I've had a, a mentor and somebody in my life that's helped me substantially to kind of push through the very tough times which I've had. And, and that's one thing. Look, when you own your own business, you're always going to go through very, very tough times. And there, there's no doubt that you'll have your ebbs and flows in business. And uh, I think it's having the perseverance and determination to go forward, either, even if you feel like you just can't anymore, you know. And um, I was sitting on my bike. I'm a very keen cyclist. I talk about adrenaline. Um, I started mountain biking two and a bit years ago. And my first ride was in Neisner. And it was actually with Teresa. Teresa was there. <laughs> you choose the, the, the easy ones. <laughs> yeah, so I <laughs> went. To the but, but let me explain what actually happened. I was doing the event. I was actually doing the Nice and the Bull with Constantia Insurance. And the guys, I uh, was very good friends with the directors, and we went running up there in the elephant environment. I think there's like an elephant sanctuary where Fila Sikint used to be, where the story Many comes from. Years. And, um, yeah, they ran with me in the mountains, and it was beautiful. And the next day... One of the directors looked at me and said, or one of the main partners looked at me and said, Chantal, well, don't, why don't you just get on a bike and try? You know, even if you get to water point one, you know, on day two, it's cool. And I thought, okay, well, I mean, well, I have nothing to lose. So I got on with my ski pants, my gym ski pants, and my tackies, but it was a cleated bike. So it was tackies with cleats. It, uh, I had this rain jacket that kept hooking. And the reason I had a rain jacket on is because it was raining. And I had a, a helmet that was kind of like, sat back on my head so it wasn't really fitted very well 
But there I went, you know. It was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Did know? someone take a picture? Because your before and your after will be quite If Teresa, <laughs> If Teresa has to see that photo, I think she will die. <laughs> and I mean, I think she saw me on the start line, but I obviously went to the back. And she was like, are you crazy? I'm like, no, I'm just going to give it a go. So I got to water point one. And actually, water point one was quite a nice, cheap track, going into a bit of, a bit of a single track, not too bad. And I got to water point one, and I was like, but I'm, I can still carry on. But little did I know what lay ahead of me <laughs> from that, from water point one to water point two, and then from water point two to water point three. And I think pretty much the most technical track you can go, right, is nice. I mean, it's really technical. Roots, rocks, bridges, you name it, you got it. And I still went and did it. I went and did the whole 67 because I'm so determined and so motivated <laughs> that I have to do it. And I managed to do it. And, I, I mean, I think any normal human being would have been like, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that ever again. But I loved it. And that was my journey into cycling. And um, I went subsequent to that. I've done Bergen Bush and Sony to Sea and two Wine to Wales. And I won my sub-vet category in Wine to Wales this previous year. Uh, so I've become quite competitive in nature with cycling. And uh, I've got Teresa Rolf that actually coaches me. And I've, I've grown substantially in my cycling, and I can see it in terms of the competition I ride again. So I, I, if I had to push quite hard, I'd be a good – I'd place well in my sub vet category. I'm never going to be a pro because I run a business. But, um, yeah, it's been an exciting journey, that. And the whole thing that I'm trying to tie together is – so I was sitting on my bike the one day, and I was like, oh, my word, what the hell am I going to do? And I was like, okay, so, so I love sports and I love cycling and somebody kind of embedded it in my head a little bit because I actually did Mad to Ride, which is a ride from um, Johannesburg to Cape Town in the beginning of the year. So it's 1,680 Ks and we did it in eight days. Definitely and mad. <laughs> <laughs> definitely mad. And then on day nine, it was August. And I mean, I'd only been cycling for about now going into two years. And we did this mad to ride, and it was just like you get stronger and stronger and fitter and fitter, and you push yourself more and more. And then the one day we had to do 250 Ks. And, you know, that, that for me in the beginning was of the year was the strangest phenomenon I found myself in because I had a lot of time. You have a lot of time to think when you're riding because you get to spaces where everyone's dead quiet, right? And it gives me goosebumps when I think about it because, like, I really spent a lot of quality time with myself, and I kind of – wanted to understand what I wanted for my future and where I was going. And, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And I came off such a high. Um, and, and Mad to Ride happened in COVID, hit, like probably a, a two weeks later. But obviously we didn't know the extent of it. But then it was like COVID a year. And we were like, I mean, I went from this high to this like, oh, my word, the whole country has changed and the whole lives are going to change. And I said to myself, okay, if I can live stream that, that I see on my screen, which is a Zwift world and has become quite a big world, is um, – I mean, I can, I can live stream and it's not rocket science. I've seen it done. But if I had to bring like a commentator in and if I had to bring some sponsors and banners and branding in, it would try, try, I would probably be able to give them exposure and it rev would revolutionize that world for us, you know, digital-wise. And <coughs> that's where Premier League South Africa was born and it has kicked up. Uh, I mean, I started with 40 people in May, the first ride. And I live streamed it. It was very basic. And now we're sitting with a community of about 1,200 people. And we've probably got about 300 to 350 people taking part every Tuesday. So it's uh, been very exciting. And then from the back end, Zwift has allowed us access from South Africa to go and create our own event. So, I mean, if anybody knows anything out there, that's a huge achievement <laughs> on any note. Because for Premier League South Africa to get that right, it means that we can really create our own races and, and choose our own routes and routes that are very specific to the race environment. So that's where I've gotten to with Premier League South Africa, which has been very exciting. But on that note, for those of you that hear Premier League, I mean, for me, and, and I'm going to be honest, when I heard Premier League, it felt like I had to be a pro. <laughs> like, I can't do this. People are going to laugh, and I don't want to be sitting at the back. But it's not like that. So go, please go on to Premier League SA on Facebook, see what it's all about. Um, go see some of the videos of the previous races. So every Tuesday morning at 6 o'clock, um, you race. And um, Chantal, you have something for all the ladies there that are watching now. If you hashtag Premier League SA, you'll have a free entry to be able to take part because it's Women's Month. Um, and it's um, uh, all uh, is, is towards um, uh, women contributing um, uh, charity uh, Yeah, so basically the initiative is definitely towards women charities. So Girls Support Girls is a, a group that exists, and they, they have a charity called Take the Thread. 
it's really about women that have been very abused in their lives and, and been, I suppose, emotionally hurt and, and, and in other physical ways. So it's a quite a big community of women, and uh, they cycle. They cycle in our community. And we've had four teams join from their side, and we've had four teams join from an insurance side. So we've really had such an amazing uptake from a woman perspective. I think women are so, you know, driven at the moment to, to also stand their ground. And let me tell you, those women rock the field. I promise you. I saw them up there on a race. It was, I would say, at 30... I mean, look, I mean, most of the men make up the race, but I would say 30% of the women were up there. So the women are very strong. Um, on that note, so Premier League, hashtag Premier League South Africa, if you put it into the um, Facebook um, comment section, comment yeah. section I'll get in touch with you because I'll see that you've hashtagged and you'll get a free entry into the last race of next week, Tuesday, which is the 24th of August. And, yeah, I mean, we'd love to have you. Come and try it out. Like we say, it's not only the Premier girls. So it's, it's fun at the same time. So it's really your choice. You make it fun or you make it competitive. It's up to you. So, so, so just tell me again. So women, women help women. So what do, we, what do they focus on? So it's women that's had trauma. Do they help them with uh, what, what kind of help? So, I can just so girls support girls. Actually, Sarah Hill um, sits on the back end, and I think she coaches the girls that are in girls support girls, and, and uh, that's GSG. And they, as a community, have built a, a platform for themselves, I suppose, to vent, discuss, talk, ask for help, because I think a lot of women out there need help, and I don't know if they know how to get that help. So I think it's really a tight-knit community that, that builds that presence for women and helps them realise that they've got people by them, you know, another woman that can, can understand and relate, you know. Uh, um, uh, um, in the beginning, Taz, you also said that, the, that what helped you with racing is the support. I think that's the biggest thing with women. You need that support. Through tough times, when you feel you want to give up, if you have that support to say, you know what, the first time you get onto the bicycle, it's going to be terrible. If something happens to you that have r knocked you down, Make sure that you're in contact with people that can support, that you can relate, that can help you and pick you up. Because everybody has been down. And it's standing up that makes you stronger. Because if you can look up, you can get up. That's a, a famous quote of, of um, Les Brown. And I so strongly believe in that. Just supporting women is so, so vital. Because whether it's business, whether it's sport, whether it's trauma, whether it is having to struggle to, to make ends meet, whether it is bringing up children that might not be as easy as some others, um, going through divorces, all these kind of things I think that women are dealing with. And a lot of the time, the reason why they totally fall apart is because they don't have support. And I think the more women can actually be there and actually just keep your ears open and make sure that we can reach out and be aware of women and stand out with strong women as well to be able to say, you know what, just, just say I have a, a problem or I need some help and we can stand up. So the Premier League SA, that's been going well. Everybody's going to go and watch and, 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 and see what's happening. We had the Mandela Day. You raised over 100,000 rand uh, with Quebec bikes as well. So have, giving uh, people the opportunity to get bicycles. And on that note, Liquid Molly was a big sponsor there. So you guys contributed 30,000 and it was such an incredibly important contribution. I don't think we understand how much. So from our side, I want to tell you that Quebec was incredibly, incredibly grateful for that support, you know. I think so many of them are unable to build the bikes that they used to, to take to the rural areas. Quebec is around, you know, building up bikes and taking it to the rural areas so that the kids can obviously get to school and have mobility and exercise and fitness. And, uh, yeah, it's been very hard for them. They've had to shut down a factory. So I think that contribution and everything we contribute on a monthly basis because we basically, as a back-end, support Quebec. And, um, I mean, on, in July, we raised 36,000 rand for them. And even though it's not, you know, for our small little community, it's, it's quite a bit. So we continue to try and drive and raise funds where we can for them all the time. And where do, where do these bicycles go to? Um, in the, the, the community that just don't have bicycles, can, can there be also a drive to be able to see? Because, I mean, there's a lot of women I know that can't cycle. Yes. And any exercise, whether you walk, whether you dance, whether you cycle... Um, racing is no, not the cheapest <laughs> one to go and do. <laughs> but if, if, if women can also be active together, I think that also helps because as soon as the oxygen in your body flows, you feel different. 
I know that was this whole uh, drive in the United States where they actually took uh, homeless shelters and just started running and how people came off drug, drugs and st stopped drinking and got their life together. So I think maybe it's also something that we should see that we can get women on bicycles that might not be able to afford it, but you can have these communities together where we can train them to cycle, even if we have to put little wheels on. Uh, Taz will be <laughs> ready with a, <laughs> with, with a cycle. I need to get my wheel pumps up first. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> so awesome. I, I think it's just making sure that women stand together. Uh, you also, I think Friday was the first show with David Higgs with the Premier Lifestyle. Um, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's um, something obviously that happened on the side now. So we've done the sporting, the e-sport, which is, you know, the live broadcast and community environment. And pretty much like the sporting world, we can do lifestyle and we can adapt and change that platform. And uh, we have done so to accommodate a cooking show. And yes, no, to my surprise, it, it, it ran very well. Um, look, it's it's real. It's it's live. There's there's no prettiness. It's it's, it's like, like we are now. Yeah, we make a mistake. That's it how it is, is. It is. But David David Higgs is a is a, an amazing character. I think he he enjoys being real, and I think that's why he dresses and he's extravagant, weird, you know, dress sense. And it's him. It's, it it talks his personality, and he's not afraid to say one or two things on on live because that's we, we're meant to all be uh, normal. But I think like our world and our perception that people have created is that you know it's all put up, you know. So this is so awesome because we've got four participants that take part a week and they take part for four weeks. So we run it for four weeks and then those uh, winners of every week go into a finale on week five. And uh, it's amazing because we bring them in and we live stream them in and they're cooking and they've got a mystery box that arrives and they don't know what's in the mystery box and all of them are cooking different ingredients. So again, this is a big drive for David Higgs' the Inner City Can Collection. Again, it's all around charity and helping people out there and what we want to do is sell these recipes, um, put them together every week. So there would be five of them every week. And then, you know, that we want the people to try and purchase that for 50 rand. So it's like 10 rand a recipe. And the awesome thing about that is that you're getting five incredible recipes because these people are so talented. I mean, when that food arrived at David Higgs' house, I was, like, impressed. I was, like, wow. And, uh, yeah, so there's such talented people out there. And we're trying to support it in a different way, you know, because I think there's a bit of donor fatigue at the moment and it, it's tough. Um, I mean, in any way, the economy is taking strain, you know. So I think we're just trying to do it in a new, unique way so that we can get some funds in, in that essence. And, yeah, we're excited to see how the shows progress. Um, but it's been very fun and it's interactive and, you know, it's a good laugh. I mean, you have a good laugh in between. So I think that's the principle behind it. And we've got some awesome brands involved. We've got Seattle. We've got Food Lovers um, Eatery. We've got uh, Fatty's Amonis. We've got um, – I have to now get all my ducks in a row here. Uh, we've got Argus stoves, I apologize, which is like a Louis Vuitton of stoves. We've got, uh, you know, Yum Champagne from Pena Ricard. And uh, then obviously the amazing food people, which is Urban, Urban Foods, La Marina Foods um, and uh, Bull and & Bush. And they have actually contributed and giving food, you know, to these participants. So it's, that's their contribution. But we're also trying to do a drive in terms of any extra food or excess food to go towards this inner city can collection. So it's a two-way street, yeah. Awesome. So, so I want to now ask you a couple of, of, of questions, both of you, just to also give some tips and things for the women out there. So, so Taz, what in your life was really, really tough? that you learned the most of? Because if, if I can, I know there's been times that I've gone through that was really something that I didn't think I would, at stage, was feeling like I was drowning. But afterwards, if I look back, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be the next step. Because that taught me to do things differently, to really look at myself. So in your life, was there something like that that had you totally um, uh, change the direction or the way you looked at life and put you on a different level? Um, I was always a very, very shy um, person growing up, and I think motorsports actually has brought me out of my shell a little bit. Um, you know, you, you get when, you, when you're younger and you're going through the, through the ranks of motorsport, you, you kind of get looked down because you're a girl in a, in a male-dominated sport. And you, I wouldn't say get bullied, but you kind of get bullied on track and get pushed around a little bit more because you are a female and the guys obviously don't want you to beat them. And I think that taught me a lot and it taught me how to fight back and to fight for my position, you know. And it just motivated me that little bit more. And I think without that, I think I would have remained a shy 
timid person that's kept to myself and never ever came out of my shell where um, I moved schools a lot, not because I was um, kicked out or anything like that. We just moved around quite a bit and um, that taught me also in a way to, to make new friends and to get out my shell. So it kind of always pushed me in that direction and I think if I didn't have that motivation and that little kick in my butt to, to fight for what I wanted and to fight for my stand in, in that specific environment, I don't think I would have I would have always remained this shy, timid girl, you know? And I think that definitely helped me and pushed me in that direction. And I think there's always those things in your life that kind of wake you up a little bit and push you in that direction. And if you don't have that stand or something that you're looking towards, um, you're never ever gonna get to that point. So I think motorsport helped me in a huge way with regards to that point. And um, yeah, I think I don't think I'd be the same person I, I am today if I, if I didn't have that, you know, that guidance and that backing throughout motorsport that I've had. So diamonds are formed under pressure. <laughs> and if you have consistent pressure and you keep on going, you are evolving, you're becoming better every single day. Yeah. And that, I think, should be every woman's goal, to be better today than what you were yesterday. Not compete against anybody, but being a better you. Susie Chantel? Yes. So I've had some big, like, pivotal parts in my life. And um, I think one that changed my life dramatically uh, was a tsunami. My, my, my sister and I were involved in a tsunami uh, when it hit and uh, we were in Paquette. And it was, yeah, I think when you face like the fear of like losing your life, you realize how invaluable your life is and you've got to live every day to its fullest and you've got to give it your all. And I kind of came out of that with this philosophy of that's it. I've got to give it my all. I've got to just live life flat out. So I think my <laughs> one of my sayings is I live life flat out. I just, I do, it's, it's in my drive to be this person and be the best person I can be and try and help as many people as I can um, in my time that I've, I have, you know. So that that's kind of what's been a big, a bi it was a big shock for me and a big thing that happened in my life. But, I mean, I think we came out, my sister, my mom, and myself, way stronger than we've ever been, so. Wow, okay, there's not a lot of people I've spoken to that have <laughs> who've gone through a tsunami. Um, I, I can just, I think any situation where you are close to actually... And, and we can every day say, live today like it's your last, but it does not hit home. Mm. It's like, okay, we say it and we treat it really try to, to imagine that that is what we're doing. But until it happens to you, I think that makes it a very, a very big reality and you really look at life in a different way. So if you have to look at, 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 at women out there and you see a lot of women struggling, maybe wanting to have businesses, maybe wanting to become strong athletes, what would be your advice to them i'm going to ask uh, you you Taz, to go first because you mentioned that life was not normal you had to, we were racing every single weekend you still had to go to school practice so there are certain certain things that you had that you gave up but in today's life and for people that want to and it doesn't necessarily have to be racing because i think that's also something that um is quite you mentioned that when you got to the W Series, you didn't realize there were so many women around the world that were racing. Yeah. But there's so many women, whether it is that they want to do triathlon or want to cycle or want to just to, be, to know that they have a talent but they, they don't know what to do. What would be your advice be to be able to make sure, where, where doesn't matter where someone is now, what do they have to keep on? What is your, your advice um, for them to be able to see or to become professional, because I, if I say professional, I mean not professional, I think the best you possibly can be. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a tough question because all you can do is you can, you gotta push yourself and uh, unless you try, unless you go for it, you're never gonna know if you can do it. So with regards to motorsports, I can say it's a very expensive sport to get involved in and it's not just easy, it's not that easy to get involved in, but go and try out indoor karting or go and try out getting someone, like lending a bicycle from someone and, and see if it's something you enjoy because you're never ever gonna pursue it if you don't enjoy it. So if it's something you really enjoy, then find those means that are gonna get you to that point that you wanna get to and don't give up until you've got to that point, you know? Um, if it's not something you enjoy, try something else um, until you find something that you really enjoy to do. And I think when you find that thing that you really enjoy and you really love, there's nothing that's ever gonna stop you from reaching that point, you know? And I think it's just pushing yourself in that direction and just giving yourself the chance to do it. 
Um, and if you don't give yourself this chance, you're always going to sit back and regret it because you, you never tried it. You never tried it, you know. And I think just go and try it. And um, if it's not something you enjoy, then try something else. Um, you'll eventually find that, that niche of yours and something that you really love to do. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you feel that much better about yourself. I love that. And, I, and um, the, the quote that says that, that you, you, on your deathbed, you're going to regret the things you didn't do. Because the only know that way that you know that you can't do something is by trying. Yeah. But if you're standing there and you're never taking that first step, you'll never know. So it's just trying. If you fall, I mean, you went down on a nice man. Think, Yay, tacky, ski pants, here we go. <laughs> and it's, it's, you loved it. If you didn't do that, if someone didn't push you to do that, you wouldn't have done it. You wouldn't be loving cycling like it is now. On your side, business-wise, I mean, you love cycling as well. But business-wise, um, what would, would, would be your advice? I mean, f even through COVID, that I have to do something else. I'm independent. I have to look after my daughter. Your advice for business women out there or people that they have a great idea and they just need to go into a direction, not give up. But what would be your advice? Because I think in any business, any situation for racing, I've never seen someone be successful in something that hasn't gone through extreme tough times. And the only difference that makes someone successful and not successful is that they didn't stop. They pushed through those tough times. So what would your advice be? Yeah, I've been through tough times. I've, I can honestly vouch for it. It's been, it's been rough. But I honestly think if you have the passion and you're passionate about something and you have that determination behind you, and the energy, I think a big part for me is you've got to have the energy and that go-getter approach. Um, I think I've always had it and I come across with lots of energy, but it is, I think you've got to, you've got to do it. You've got to have that energy. You've got to come across being determined, motivated, focused. And I, I, I guarantee you in some way or form, you will get there. But I do believe, as you said, Taz, I mean, support is such a big structure for progressing in your life because you're going to hit highs and lows and it's great. So it's great when it's high because people support. I mean, they, they say well done and it's, you know, congratulations. But when you're low, you know, who is there to pick you up and who is there to help you through it, you know? And I think that's it, you know, support is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. So my family, I'm also very close to my family. Um, I mean, we've got a very tight-knit family. And then I've got some really key special people in my life uh, friends, and then, like I said, I, I, I have a mentor that helps me from a business perspective. So if you could find somebody, um, which is, for example, you, reminds me of a, a woman that would guide and help people from a business perspective. So if people could find a mentor that they can relate to and they can talk to, it helps them to push over to that, that next level, you know. And, and then you've got to have the energy and the determination, I think, the combination. So I know a lot of people, and I've had that, and say, oh, but I don't have that support structure. I don't have. I'm on my own. And my advice always to, to, to anybody is there are women that have been where you are now, and they've made a success of their life. And if you don't have that support structure, you can always learn from you, from you, from so many women out there. So it is just being able to relate to someone being able to hear from someone where they started from nothing, had to go through such bad times to get anywhere, but where they are today and can actually share that story. So there are so many ways and places to be able to find support. And there are so many women that are willing to share, like you ladies are today, and we're so grateful for that. So I just think it's important that you should not be just on your own mind um, because you can't fix a problem with the same mind that created it. If you want to be success, learn from people that are successful because not anybody, none, nobody is successful without going through those tough times. A little bit on a lighter note. So what do you like to do when you want to relax? I'm going to sort of ask you, Chantel. I know you like Merlot, so maybe from tomorrow yes, you should not buy that. Definitely <laughs> my, my glass of wine at night. That definitely is it. But I love my family. I spend a lot of time with my family. And friends, you know, I, and I, I'm not a big going out person. I actually enjoy the brides and the home time and the, the quality time with people. But yeah, you know, I'm a socialite, so I enjoy seeing people. I like spending time with them. I enjoy my glass of wine. I love my daughter. My daughter's my little, the love of my life. And, uh, you know, anything that I can do with that child makes me happy. So, you know, that, that it, in, in essence is my key thing, you know, spending time with my daughter. <laughs> awesome. You, Taz? Yeah, I'm also not a, a massive um, jeweler, like you would say. Um, hey, I was thinking, yeah. you going to say, like you? Like, uh. 
<laughs> um, but I do, I do enjoy spending time with my family and my friends. I mean, I've, my family, we're very, very close. But I also, if we're not, uh, racing is a massive part of my life. So if we're not, if I'm not actually racing, we're at the racetrack. And um, whether it's with my dad, supporting my dad at off-roads, or we're watching motocross, or we uh, at the karting, doing some laps. And um, we also have a place at the dam, so we do a lot of water sports as well. So we quite an active family and we do a lot of it like we always we always busy and playing golf or we're doing something you know so I think that's what I enjoy doing most when I'm not at the racetrack actually in the zone and behind the steering wheel um you know we're doing something along the lines of motorsports or we're watching it on tv and yeah I think that's that's the things we enjoy the most awesome and, and who's your role model do you have someone that's that you look up to I mean, there's a, there's a few people I look up to, but I'm trying to, I mean, like I said, I have a mentor, but but I, like a role model, look, my mother's guided me so much in her life, you know, so my mom's uh, an entrepreneurial woman, and she's been an entrepreneur her whole, whole life, I mean, since I've known her, um, and yeah, I suppose I get that entrepreneurial spirit from her, so her guidance, her motivation, my dad's guidance and his motivation, look, they used to get me out to the gym, talk about an active family, um, I mean, I used to play hockey. I was first team hockey, and I used to run. I used to do 400, 800, cross country. You know, I was very active as well in my life. And um, But, you know, my parents, would, regardless of me doing that, that sport time would get me up religiously every morning at 5 o'clock to go to gym with them. So, hence, <laughs> why Chantal exercises every morning at 5 o'clock, you know. So, listen, when it's built into you and instilled into you, it's such an important thing, I think, for me. I even do it with my daughter. I mean... I, I mean, she's four years old, but I mean, I do Pilates with her, and she actually enjoys it, and she messes around. Obviously, she's not doing every move or that, but, you know, it's that routine. It's, I think everything in life is a little bit of a routine and, and getting somebody in, used to it because that kind of also helps with that motivation to continue doing it for the rest of your life, you know. It's funny. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how people that are successful always have these disciplines of habits that they have, starting early, making sure that they're committed, training, so yeah, it's a, it's it's success leaves clues. So make some notes. <laughs> Daz? Um, my dad is as my biggest um, role model. So I think, like I said, he's always he's always been there. He's always supported us. He's always guarded us. Um, we don't often, well, we don't always get along. Um, we you know we That's fight because we very uh, <laughs> I think we're very similar in like all, in a lot of ways. So um, we do butt heads a lot. But he's always that, that support structure that will always be there regardless. And he's always so proud of what we've done. And he, he always is there looking and watching and um, guiding us in the direction that we need to go into. So I think neither of us would be where we are if it wasn't for my dad pushing us. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of parents are there, but they're kind of living through their, through their kids, you know, where my dad has done all these things already and he's, he's achieved in so many things in, in his life that he's there to, yes, he's, push, he's pushing us, but it's not because he's living through us. He wants us to achieve the best that we possibly can and, you know, um, the way he's pushed us and guarded us, um, that's the reason why we are where we are. So, yeah, definitely that's my dad. So stunning. So what is your goal for the next... Okay, so so in C90 never eventually, <laughs> but I think as well it's through uh, everybody has has, has taken um, a situation where to stand out and change things. And you know you have to innovate and you have to do things a little bit different, and that just helps you to be able to to grow afterwards and be stronger. But what is your goal for the next few years? What is what is the plans? I mean, for your side, it's racing, but business wise as well. So what is the what is your goal for the next two to five years? I think digital space is a big space. Um, I think live stream and the way we conceptualize and do things going forward is going to be new and, and, and through digital. So I think people will get more and more used to the digital world and I think there will be a big focus from an event perspective for me to drive that with my two platforms. I think there's substance in it and I think there's something there. Uh, whether races begin, I still believe it's a great, like Zwift is a great uh, training tool. It's a, it's a safe tool. You know, there's a good chance that you're not going to get hit on the road where there's a lot of stories happening like that recently. So, yeah, you know, you can look at it as a twofold thing. You also, you know, you can spend more time with your family. I think a lot of times with any sport, and I mean, we all know this with golf or you, you spoke about golf, it's, it's the same. I mean, you know, it takes a lot, a lot of hours out of your day. So also if you're like a, a new a single mom or a, a mom, 
it's tough to, to do that. So that's why the trainer is so nice and that world is so nice. So you can still be part of something in the community, but, um, you know, there's, there's substance there. So I think we'll continue. I'll continue my journey there, but I'd love to still obviously do my corporate eventing side. I mean, that's a, a big drive for me. I love making things look good and not making them look pretty and elegant. And, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll continue with the corporate eventing when it allows. Um, but, yeah, I think that will change for me in terms of uh, my, my broadcast live stream environment, yeah. Okay, so make sure to follow on all our social platforms. You can see all the new Premier League, Premier Lifestyle, all the different things that are happening. Thank you. Kaz? Um, yeah, one. no. <laughs> Formula One is a <laughs> dream that's never going to happen. <laughs> I kind of have to put that one at, um, be, uh, to bed. Um, but, yeah, I think just to become a professional um, driver, um, getting paid to race, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, right now, it's just hopefully I can get back into W Series next year with we don't know what's actually happening with the championship. Um, missed out this year on some really cool places and seeing different places and being involved with Formula One. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit disappointing that we never got that opportunity this year, but hopefully we'll have that next year. And from there, you never know. You just push yourself, do as well as you can, um, put as much effort into it as you can, and you never know where it's going to take you. Well, holding thumbs for W Thank Series you. because it was so impressive. Just 64 to 10, and I still believe <laughs> the top <laughs> positions can be possible. Now, I got into a car with um, with Taz, it was now in the nine hour, <laughs> and everybody else was wearing helmets, and she was not. <laughs> and she d I didn't have to put one on. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but um, it's unbelievable to get in a car and have someone like chat to you, like they were reading a newspaper, <laughs> and you see all the corners and you hear all the tires, and she is like she's having a ball, and it's just it's you know, it's like really nothing amazing. happening. Awesome, she <laughs> really can awesome. drive. Um, ladies, I want to thank you. <laughs> Must push our table. <laughs> I want to thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you having an impact in women's lives on a racing scale, on a business scale, on a cycling hour, the Premier League, and also with Premier Lifestyle, having just making, in, using innovation and, and doing things differently. And I think um, for everybody, please hashtag the Premier League SA to get those free entries on the 24th. Uh, women are unbelievable. You have unbelievable p potential and there's a support structure. If you look for something, you'll find it. And there's a lot of women who want to share and want to help because I think still that is the ideal, having to be able to have an impact on someone else that they can be a success. And um, I want to end off by asking you just the last lesson for, for, for women out there. What would be that just something you want to share with women to make them know that they have everything they need to be and um, they have so many talents. Uh, just your last piece of advice. I just think don't let anyone tell you you can't do something, um, whether it's a, a male or another female, whatever it is. If, if it's something you want to do, go for it, and don't let anyone tell you you can't. Love it. And mine would be just live life flat out. Just give it your all. That, that's got to be mine because that's how I live. So yeah, just, just go balls to the walls. <laughs> Your balls to the walls. <laughs> Did you have those? <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much for everybody watching. Um, hope it was inspirational. It was very inspirational, uh, inspirational to me. These ladies are um, uh, close. If you wanted to get some of their contact details, we'll have their hashtag and their website and all the details that you can follow them on their Instagram and on their Facebook and all their social media. Thank you so much for all the women out there. Go out and be a female. Be proud of it. Don't fit in. Stand out and thrive. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.